Hey guys, welcome back to the Predicta 17 or 3 restoration series. When we last left off, I was still puzzling over how to disassemble this so I could get at the stuff. This is as far as I got, which was remove the front, remove the back, and remove the wraparound cabinet. But I still have not penetrated into the heart of the circuitry, especially the three electrolytic cans that are buried <laughs> in between the CRT and the stuff down here. Well, some developments since we left off. One, in Riders, I think it's volume 25, yeah, Riders 25, they have the full Philco uh, service info, factory service info for this set. For those of you not familiar with Riders television series, yes, in addition to the Riders radio uh, service info publications, there is a series of television um, volumes. I believe there are 28 in total. Uh, the, the first volumes cover pre-war TVs. I started way at the beginning and uh, continued up to about 1960. And I believe they went out of business, maybe pressure from Sam's photo fact, I don't know. So unlike Sam's, who would buy a set and reverse engineer it, take photos and draw up their own schematics, riders generally, or maybe always, would work with the original manufacturer and simply reprint the factory service info. So that's what we have here, and they have... Most importantly, chassis and CRT removal instructions. So, deciphering this, I got as far as step eight. Separate wraparound cabinet from chassis CRT assembly. All right, so we can pick up there. Next step, it says disconnect anode lead and CRT socket. They're talking about this, and they're talking about that. Uh, I did have this set powered up when we left off. So there's a chance there's a bit of a charge left on that. So I am going to discharge it. And yes, I know the better way to do it is to put a resistor in series with a bit of metal that you ground and bleed it off. I don't think there's going to be much of a charge left, so I'm just going to use a screwdriver and go to the chassis. And yeah. One thing to note is once you have a set kind of working, you kind of have a raster, when you turn it off and you see the image or the raster fade away, it's taken away most, if not all, of the high voltage. So once you get the set kind of working, uh, when you turn it off, the charges tend to, to bleed away. You don't have to worry about it so much. All right, the next step is to remove the four quarter inch sheet metal screws on the front and then apparently the entire CRT is going to come out and they warn you about the yoke. The yoke is hanging on the CRT right here. We need to loosen that up and that is still wired into the set. Well you have two choices. You can leave it attached to the CRT and take it out with it but you need to disconnect the wires going to it or take it off the CRT and leave it connected, but you're going to need to support it, otherwise it's going to tear away in the wires. Um, now, of course, they're not plugged into sockets, because why would they do that? That would be too convenient. No, I can see these wires are just going right up in there, hardwired into stuff. And there's tape, which I'm just going to tear off here, because it's super crumbly anyways, and I want to separate these wires, because some of these wires are going to the CRT socket, and some are going to the yoke. <sighs> I would, well, I'm torn. See, once we've done some work, we want to power the set back up. Well, we can remount the CRT and reattach everything. Or, I can use a little baby 8-inch test CRT, but in order to use that, I need to have the yoke. So that's why I want to try to leave the yoke wired in and take it off the CRT and maybe put some a foam block or something under there. To support it. Okay, now another development before I forget is I have a set of reproduction Philco networks. I did a little post on the community tab of my uh, YouTube channel 
explaining the different nomenclature for these. I generally call them couplates. It turns out that these names, they're all trademark names the different manufacturers used. I believe couplate, C-O-U-P-L-A-T-E, is what Sprague called them. Another manufacturer called them bowl plates, I believe. Another called them P-E-C. Philco, I believe, calls them resistor condenser modules. I'm going to find it on here. Yeah, the other parts listed is, uh, let's start with the N on the parts list. Resistor Condenser Network. So that is the official Philco term for these. So I have some reproduction resistor condenser networks. From the TV Restorer guy, he's the guy I've been buying um, also the reproduction networks for the predictors I've been working on. So this is 9H25, so it matches this chassis. So that will save us some time. All right, back to disassembly. Uh, in order to get the yoke off, we need to loosen up a nut down here or sheet metal screw. Sort of like a hose clamp going around things. That's all what holds this on. And usually from age, it's kind of stuck on that. There we go. That's all that holds it on, this whole big assembly is just one little screw down here and a clamp on the neck and that's it, and you just slide it right off. Alright, let's go back to the front here. It's that same tool. To get all these off. Well, you can see why these were never serviced or rarely serviced. You're paying by the hour to have something fixed. So it wouldn't be worth it. Just go buy yourself a new TV. They did sell a lot of these. Apparently it was a fairly popular set. But apparently there are not a whole lot of them left. Around. Portable TVs tended to... Uh, Get tossed, I've noticed. Late 50s, early 60s, or throughout the 60s, portable TVs are not that plentiful compared to the pretty console sets, I think people would say, because they used them as furniture or decor, or the predictors because they look so cool, but these. Uh, but also a lot of them are gone because people cannibalize them for the picture tube because they go, they uh, are compatible 100% with predictor TVs. Well, indeed, this does come away. We have ah, there we go. That thunk was the yoke coming down. So, yeah, <laughs> there it is. So, the CRT is mounted to that frame. The original labels barely hanging on here. See what do we have? Oh, geez. That is just completely disintegrated. 17 DAP4, which is the earliest incarnation. Later, they had a 17 DRP4, which is slightly different specs. Now I'm thinking I really should disconnect this. You know, when I move this around, it's going to fall off, it's going to tip over, it's going to tug on those wires. I'll see uh, a document where they're attached. There aren't that many wires. I think there's just four, maybe five. It's usually two or three on the horizontal and two on the vertical, so not the end of the world. Alrighty. Now what? Well, we can start in a lot of places. We could redo the electrolytics. We could start doing the paper caps that are just on terminal strips here and there. Or we could take out the circuit boards. I decided to start with what I have the most experience with. And that is the printed circuit boards. These are very similar in their construction and installation to Philco Predictas of the same era. Meaning they are attached on these grounding stakes, they go up through the board, and 
they have the wire wrap wires around the vertical stakes here. So I just had to undo a few wires and unsolder the grounding points to get out the sweep board. That's where I decided to start. That has four of the resistor capacitor networks on it, which were all replaced with the replicas. And I replaced the handful of paper caps and most of the resistors. That's a 1.2K. I don't have any on hand. I'm going to pick some up and I'll replace that. The sockets look to be in pretty good condition, so I'm going to leave them alone. Sometimes these 9-pin sockets uh, can develop stress cracks, but these look to be in really good shape, probably because the set really hasn't been serviced. Uh, and then I proceeded to get this board out, which is a little bit more challenging. It was mounted vertically. This is the sound board. I have not done any work on it yet. Uh, there were a bit more wires to get out, and it was just in an, in an awkward place tucked in underneath the IF board. Uh, and this has a different kind of tube socket I just noticed for the uh, 7 and 9 pin. I don't know why that would be. So somebody had asked me about um, these tube sockets and are they held in by just the, the copper traces. No, not on these. These, every tube pin is sort of a hollow metal and under tension and they snap into the holes on the circuit board so they're held on there very tightly the solder on the other side is not what's holding them in place not so with these I think I think these are strips of metal that go through and get bent over on the opposite side so these would be uh, more subject to stress and strain as tubes are pushed in and removed but they came out pretty easily so I'm not really concerned about that either uh, so there are a few paper caps to replace on this. Those are those plastic tubes there, the bumblebee caps. Uh, they might look a little odd if you haven't seen this type before, but those are paper caps inside of a plastic tube that's painted with stripes to indicate the value. Uh, as far as the yoke, well, things didn't quite go as I had hoped with the yoke. I wanted to completely remove it. I started to. I ended... Uh, three connections that went down to this terminal strip that was really easy to do and then I ran into some problems <laughs> um, one of the wires goes directly into this transformer this vertical output transformer they just took the long lead from it and ran it right down inside of the yoke housing I just cut it uh, I figured that was safer than trying to pry off this brittle plastic cap and uh, trying to unsolder the connection and then put that cap back on uh, these are known for deteriorating and falling apart. More so a problem earlier in the 50s, but even this, it, it shrunk a bit, and I, I don't want to risk damaging it. It's easy enough to cut the wire and splice it back together. And then there's this wire. Or so I thought it was a wire. It turns out, when I traced it down through where it goes, there's actually two conductors inside of this, and I think it might be shielded or so, or it's some type of special wire. That's for the horizontal winding, which is going gonna, gonna to have a bit more voltage than I think this type of wire insulation can handle. So that, um, I don't want to mess with it. Same deal, I'd have to get into this housing and disconnect it there. It's tough to get at it at the other end, and I don't want to cut it. So I'm just going to, at least with that, with it like this, I, I have plenty of wire length. I can really put it off to the side while I'm working on the set. I'm not, I'm not worried about damaging it. So far, that has been the biggest hassle I've found, was the yoke. I'll even warn you about that in the service info and the disassembly instructions. This, <laughs> be warned, the yoke is attached by wires, and uh, you can't unplug it. Uh, so, all right, so I'm going to finish up with this board, and then there's a final one underneath this cover. I think this board is basically identical to the ones in Predictors. We shall see. Uh, some sheet metal screws will get this cover off, and then a few connections to undo, and it'll come right out. There should only be about four or five wires going to that board, I think. That's uh, IF in, video out, ground, power, filament supply. That's about it. Maybe a GC bus. Um, UHF tuner. Just taking up a bit more, taking up a 
bit of space here. I imagine it's easier to work on this set if you don't have the UHF option, but we do. Uh, but there aren't going to be any parts in there we need to worry about. These super high frequencies, they, don't, they certainly don't use paper caps. It's all going to be just micro strip and this little bits of bent and twisted wire to make inductors and capacitors at that high a frequency. So we won't need to do anything with that. Uh, and then the VHF tuner has one cap on it. It's probably for the tuner AGC. We want to replace that. Otherwise, we probably don't need to go into the tuner or do anything with that. Which just leaves this stuff. Uh, the three electrolytics I still have to deal with and these two paper caps. So, um, just about all the parts are on those circuit boards. So, yeah, it's a pain to get this apart. Yeah, it's a pain to get the boards out. Yeah, I'd had to take a lot of reference photos so I know how to put them back in. That being said, once they're out, they're really easy to work on. I blew through this board in no time. Got it all cleaned up and reflowed all the solder joints. So hopefully when I put them all back in, they'll just work. Because <laughs> this is not something uh, you want to have to troubleshoot. So let's get to the electrolytics. Um, I've been kind of mapping out where I can install them. There's four suction with the can going to the chassis. Now three of these wires go right to this terminal strip. And this lug and this lug are ground. One cap goes here, one goes here, one goes here. Seems like a no-brainer to install three electrolytics on this terminal strip and we're almost done. The fourth one was a wire going off here wrapping around I think inside there somewhere. So that one may take a little bit of thinking. Um, this guy is insulated, it goes to the AC line, so I may very well just want to install a little two terminal, terminal strip using that screw. And this guy I have not figured out quite yet. Um, I can see one lug goes here, so that's awesome. We can have, uh, oh no, sorry, that's just the ground. Yeah, they do that sometimes. So the can is common negative for all the electrolytic capacitors inside. And it is got a metal strap and it's screwed to the chassis. But often as an extra secure grounding they will run a, a heavy gauge wire, this is heavier gauge than these wires, to a terminal strip or solder it directly to the chassis. So that's what this is. And it looks like there are three sections on this electrolytic. One of them goes over to a board on the on the other side here so maybe we can mount the cap on that circuit board um, one of them goes up on, onto this circuit board and the last one also goes up to this circuit board so uh, I'll think about it I have not pulled this board yet that's the IF board um, there should be plenty of room on it, so I might install caps on that. There's probably two voltage supply rails that go to this. Um, and those must be filter caps for it. So, I probably could just mount them to the circuit board and, uh, and be done with it. I'm now working on remounting the restuffed boards. I have the sweep board installed and double checking on my work with uh, checking the wires up correctly. I did take a lot of reference photos and I've also been going off the service info. Next up I will reinstall this board but before I do I wanted to take a peek under uh, the shield at the IF board. There are no paper caps under here and I would prefer to not remove it so what I'm doing is checking all the resistors. There's a few of them that are high, but the spec on these is, for a lot of these, is 20%, some 10%. So a little bit high is okay. Uh, so far, uh, I don't see any reason to take it out. I have a few more to check. Uh, once I'm done with that, I'll put the shield back down and install this board. And also want to replace this guy, the death cap, the cap that goes across the AC line. I'll replace that with a Type X2. One of uh, these guys. 
<sighs> and uh, I'm going to double and triple check all my work. Make sure we have continuity through the filament string. I reinstalled the rebuilt boards. Hooked all the wiring back up best I could based on my reference photos and the service info. Tried to rig up a little 8-inch test CRT. That did not go well. That did not go well. Uh, you'd see it there in the background. I actually ended up having to take the base off of it because uh, I got hung up on the yoke. Uh, turns out that unfortunately those test CRTs, the 8YP4, are not well suited for these CRTs because these are all glass. I forget what they call this, uh, button base or something like that. There's no bake like they don't have this collar on them. It's just smooth glass all the way up to the end, and then they have pins that, that come out in a small base. So the yoke can just it's just all glass and the yoke slides easily on and off. Bake light base has a lip on it and it got hung up on that, so that was a no-go. So I just pulled out the full-size CRT. I don't have it screwed. This is the frame screwed together though, so I just use an alligator clip to complete the circuit. I've already powered it up with the fusible resistor pulled out just to check the tube filaments for continuity and they all lit up. So this is going to be our first power up uh, with uh, B+. I do have a signal source hooked up because I'm feeling optimistic. Let's see what we get. Current's at about 0.6 amps, that's just the tube filaments. Should go up as they start conducting and pulling down B+. Plus. Yeah, we're going up. We're at about an amp. Amp and a quarter. Hey, we have a raster. Don't have a speaker hooked up. Uh, no snow though. Let's see, it's brightness. Doesn't seem quite as bright as it could be, but we'll worry about that later. Let's see, I think that's a vertical. And one of these controls is kind of, not kind of, it is messed up. It's really hard to turn, and it's it's loose. So I think we're going to have to take that apart and dissect it a little bit. Unfortunately, it's a dual control. Probably very difficult to track down an exact replacement, so we'll try to patch that up. Uh, let's see. So that's a good start. Nothing's going up in smoke, and we have... Well, deflection and a raster. But the tuner's not doing anything. Even with those signal starts, we should have snow. Um, so, could be a few possibilities. The output of the tuner might be not going into the IF board correctly. The output of the IF board might not be going into the video board correctly. Uh, of course, I might have hooked up uh, something wrong. The video is this wire right here. It's hardwired directly into the video soundboard, which is the most difficult one to get at. It's below the IF boards. The sound video board is in the bottom left-hand corner there. So let me check that. Maybe something as stupid as I didn't hook up the coax output from the tuner to the IF. Nothing obvious jumped out at me. The tuner seems to be hooked up properly. Didn't notice any disconnected wires or wiring mistakes. So, I'm going to break off here in the next installment. We're going to get out the B and K and do some signal injection and try to find out where the problem is.